Greetings, everyone. Welcome to your Swedenborgian community online. Today we are diving into the 18th century uh, mystic Emanuel Swedenborg's ideas about how the Lord's human nature was made divine in Christ, uh, but also how the Lord speaks to every religion, every process of health and growth across the world, no matter our words for God, our ideas about religion or philosophy, um, God meets us where we're at. And so, specifically, we are in the section entitled, The Lord Made His Human Nature Divine, Out of the Divine Nature Within Himself, and in this way became one with the Father, in Emanuel Swedenborg's book, The Lord, which you can download for free in the description or on our website, swedenborgiancommunity.org, under free books. And on this uh, topic, there's been a lot of speculation in many different Christianities. And what's interesting for me about Swedenborg's is that his idea of what it meant to be God in the world was primarily about process. And he also had that idea uh, when it comes to what it means for us to move with God, to work with God in our lives. It's about process. Uh, we go through oscillations of ups and downs, and the Lord, if we're allowing him, her, um, however we like to describe God, to work in our lives, is pulling us ever upwards, no matter our tradition, by the way. And so he starts off this section by highlighting a doctrinal creed of all of Christianity. And he's doing this partly because, or at least Protestant Christianity, he's doing this partly because um, he knows that some of his ideas seem off to mainline Christians, but he's pointing out, no, like in your doctrine, uh, often this is what it says. And I don't think we've been true to that. I don't think Christians have been true to that. Uh, we must become more open and have a better understanding of the Lord. And so he quotes, our Lord Jesus Christ, the son of God is both God and a human being. Although he is God and a human being, yet he is not two but one Christ. He is one because the divine nature took the human nature to itself. Indeed, he is one altogether because he is one person. Therefore, as the soul and the body make one human being, so God and a human being is one Christ. So he's quoting the uh, doctrinal statement from, I believe, the Athanasian statement of faith. Yes. And so he's trying to say this idea about three persons in God doesn't fit with your own doctrine. And so kind of similar to what Muslims often criticize Christians for when they were growing as a faith back when Muhammad was still alive, we see it at the Dome of the Rock, the oldest uh, Muslim uh, mosque slash uh, place of worship slash temple. Uh, they had a criticism of the three persons idea in Christianity. And Swedenborg is saying from his own Christian viewpoint, uh, he also has like a little issue with this. He doesn't believe um, dividing God into three persons and yet saying each one's God, each one's infinite, etc., is doing us a service. In fact, he thinks it kind of uh, undermines our ideas about God and our faith ultimately. So he says these words are quoted from the Athanasian statement of faith, which is accepted throughout the Christian world, at least at the time still is today. And these are that statement's essential points concerning the oneness of what is divine and what is human in the Lord. Hmm. Other points concerning the Lord in that statement will be explained in the, their proper places. This brings up a good question for most of us is how does that work? Swedenborg or whoever, this idea of God is human and God is divine. Um, because he's saying, well, let's just make it clear they're one. But we may still have questions like, okay, so what does that mean? And for him, ultimately, everything that makes us human, um, our consciousness, our intelligence, our subtlety, even the usefulness of our form um, ties back to God. It points to God because God is consciousness itself, infinite consciousness, the root of our consciousness. Uh, God is awareness. God is helpful form in everything, not just human beings. 
A god is being able to hug another person, be compassionate, to let go of judgment and all the things that hurt ourselves more than uh, they hurt the people we're often judging, even, yes, when we nail them to a cross. And so his point is that the things that make us truly humane and subtle and divine uh, as a human being um, is made infinitely more so in God, truly divine, truly uh, wonderful. And uh, not in a derogatory sense for us because God is right there in everything. It's not just that we point to God, it's that God is the root of each of these things in ourselves. So he goes on to say, this shows us very clearly that according to the statement of faith of the Christian church, the divine and human natures in the Lord are not two but one. Just as the soul and the body is one human being, and that the divine nature took the human nature to itself. So he's saying it's like a soul and body. So if we're confused, we can just kind of relate it to the, the mystery of consciousness often. I know a lot of us like to think, well, it's just the brain. Well, as we're finding, it's more complicated than that. It's not just the, the matter of the brain. There seems to be maybe something quantum involved. And what is quantum physics truly? Um, except for that mysterious interconnection of all uh, particles and waves and the, the non-duality but seeming duality of the universe interacting in these concrete ways, but also a little bit more fuzzy around the edges, right? And so he's saying that's essentially how we should understand God as Christ, the infinite soul of divinity in the body of a human being. And he goes further to say, it follows from this that the divine nature cannot be separated from the human or the human from the divine, because separating them would be like separating soul and body. So he's, he's pointing out you can't have one without the other. Interestingly enough, though, if he believed Christ was the only incarnation of God, I, I will mention, of course, there's other faiths that believe God uh, took a human form, uh, then was it not always so that a soul needed a body? I wonder what, how he would um, explore that. I know he often says that heaven um, is essentially God's spiritual body in a lot of ways, that every being of heaven, all called angels, by the way, if you make it to heaven, you're an angel, according to Swedenborg. A lot of us talk like that, like, oh, he got his wings, etc. But um, Swedenborg had visions of that, supposedly, and uh, he believed that everything that made up heaven was from God in the purest sense. Not as much like us, where we can kind of fall off the, the wagon for a moment or, or two, um, but in a, in a really held state of purity, but each in our own way, because God's infinite. Um, and so I think he also relates the church to the body, uh, not just the Christian church, but kind of a more mystical or esoteric idea of the church, where it's the goodness, the healthy spirituality in all people is the church. Uh, just you are the church, uh, if to the extent that you have those things, which we all do to some extent. And so that's also body. And then we have, of course, the body of Christ. And then everyone, he says, will acknowledge this who reads the passages about the Lord's birth site above and from the two gospels. Um, and it's obvious from these passages that Jesus was, was conceived by Jehovah God and born of the Virgin Mary. This means that there was something divine within him and that this was his soul. Yeah, so we explored that a little earlier. I invite you to watch some of our earlier videos in the Lord discussion series. Um, and he goes further to say, Now since his soul was the actual divine nature of the Father, it follows that his body or human side was made divine as well. For where the one is, the other must also be. In this way and in no other way, the Father and the Son are one, which it often says in Scripture. The Father in the Son, and the Son in the Father, which it also says, and all that is the Son's is the Father's, and all that is the Father's is the Son's, as the Lord himself tells us in the Word, on, in John 17, 10. But how this union was brought about, I need to explain in the following sequence. And he lists one. Um, the first thing he'll explain is the Lord from eternity is Jehovah, 
to the Lord from eternity or Jehovah took on a human nature for the purpose of saving us. Three, he made the human nature divine from the divine nature within himself. So it's kind of like an unfolding process, it sounds like. Four, he made the human nature divine by the trials to which he made himself vulnerable. So even Christ went through trials of temptation um, where he opened his spirits to vulnerability. Um, Swedenborg explains that's essentially the hell's approaching, or temptations approaching, etc. And then five, the complete union of the divine nature and the human nature in him was accomplished by the suffering on the cross, which was his last trial. So not the only trial, not the, you know, the be all end all as uh, some people often kind of point to, but the last of his human trials. And then six, step by step, he took off the human nature he had taken on from his mother and put on a human nature from what was divine within him, which is the divine human nature in the Son of God. So this is kind of this process of, you know, he took on a more finite human nature from the earth, from his family, his ancestors, his mother. Um, and no matter how great she was, that still has its roots in this, this history. And as he took on more of his glory, as it's said in scripture, he was being glorified, it said, uh, he put off any limitations to that and put on the infinity of his spirit, of his divine soul. Um, and so he became Jehovah within and without, so to speak. And in this way, number seven, God became human on both the first or innermost level and the last or outermost level. So Alpha and the Omega, essentially. So now we're on uh, section 30, where he's going to kind of break down each of these sections. And we won't read every scripture this time because uh, Swedenborg loves quoting scripture. If you don't think he's grounded in scripture um, for whatever reason that these ideas are, are just kind of from the top of his head, I think uh, you'll, you'll learn that he likes to, to root everything in scripture. And I think that's often healthy. Uh, one example being often when we talk about Christ being our master, our savior, or whatever it is that we say in our Christian denomination or our Christian walk, if we are Christian, we often don't pay attention to what he asked us to do, you know, social justice and all that, forgiving people, um, uplifting people, empowering the poor, the oppressed, etc. right? That's pretty much his ministry and also repentance, so changing ourselves, um, letting go of the more hurtful things, the oppressive natures. Um, you know, often he talked about that, but we tend to just point to the fact that he's our savior and we don't really focus on that all the time. And we, we condemn other people because we say he's not their savior or they haven't accepted him. And yet we're not looking at their hearts or how they live or uplifting them if they are downtrodden. And so in a way, a lot of times our faith in Christ becomes disconnected to what he said. And what did he say about that? He actually addressed that. He said, why call me Lord, Lord, or why say Lord, Lord, and not do what I told you to do? Um, and so Swedenborg grounding everything in scripture I find to be refreshing, and also because, weirdly enough, it starts to make more sense than anything I heard growing up um, in my Baptist churches or, or Salvation Army churches. So he goes on to say, The Lord from eternity is Jehovah, number one. This we know from the word, since the Lord said to the Jews, Truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. In John 8. And again, he also said, Glorify me, Father, with the glory I had with you before the world existed. John 17. This means the Lord from eternity and not the Son from eternity. Because the Son is his human nature, conceived by Jehovah the Father and born of the Virgin Mary in time, as explained above. So he's kind of addressing an old held belief that the Son, like Jesus Christ, the son was hanging out with God the Father from eternity. They were both playing cards from the beginning of time. They had a lot of nice visits by the lake. No, he's saying, no, that there's one God, and that's the God from eternity. There weren't two gods hanging out. And he says, we are assured by many passages in the word that the Lord from eternity is Jehovah himself, a few of which passages may be cited now. 
Uh, quoting from Isaiah 25, it will be said on that day, this is our God. We have waited for him to free us. Jehovah, we have waited for him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So he's quoting Hebrew scripture, Jewish scripture from Isaiah saying, no, th this made it clear that this, the Savior, the one who will come, uh, is Jehovah, not, not a separate God. And he also says, we can see from this that the speakers were waiting for Jehovah God himself. And then quoting from Isaiah, but also the Christian Gospels at the same time, because they quote the same thing. A voice of someone in the wilderness crying out, prepare a pathway for Jehovah. Make level in the desert a highway for our God. The glory of Jehovah will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. Behold, the Lord Jehovah is coming in strength. I always think it's interesting that the Jehovah and to Jehovah um, change sometimes. Uh, so there we go. God is coming. Jehovah God is coming in strength. Here too, the Lord who is to come is called Jehovah. And then quoting from Isaiah, I am Jehovah. I will make you a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. I am Jehovah, this is my name, and I will not give my glory to another. So, only Jehovah God has the glory of Jehovah God. A covenant for the people and a light for the nations is the Lord and his human nature. Because this is from Jehovah and was made one with Jehovah, it says, I am Jehovah, this is my name, and I will not give my glory to another. That is, to no one other than himself. To give glory is to glorify, or to unite with himself. Interesting. So, in a way, we have this, there's still kind of a dichotomy here, right? Like, he has to unite something with himself. Well, we kind of see that in our own lives, as God slowly unites each of us to himself. Maybe it'll take forever. Unlike with Christ, where he was glorified within a lifetime um, and, you know, did all those miracles, had, had this kind of uh, divine nature flowing through him. We each have that to our own extent, because as it said, we're all one in God. But Jehovah decided he had to kind of, you know, take a few steps further with this incarnation and essentially made the soul of uh, Christ himself. That's how Christ was born, and that's why everything in his life connected with Scripture in such a way. And um, as we heard earlier, that process of him growing and being glorified actually helped us all out by reordering the hells. He, he let them approach him. He kind of fought against them, we're said in the Spirit, and he put them kind of in a healthier place for all of us. Um, and the hells, of course, being you know, that part of us that uh, those of us who might have passed on, who continue to want to create hell for ourselves and for others. Uh, we are put into communities or we actually find communities that are right for us, um, spiritual communities, and we continue to make hell. Now, who knows if people leave hell eventually, uh, but it's not something that God just kind of forces on unbelievers so to speak, you know, like all non-Christians, all non-Muslims or something. Uh, but it's something that we take on for ourselves, as we often do in this life to some extent, right? And he goes further to quote um, a few places, just pointing to this uh, glory that he will unite to himself. And then moving past that, we can see from these passages that the Lord from eternity means his divine nature as the source, which is called Jehovah in the word. We will see from passages um, to be cited below that after his human nature had been glorified, both the Lord and Jehovah means the divine nature and the human nature together as one. And that the son by itself means the divine human nature. So on to section two. The Lord from eternity or Jehovah took on a human nature for the purpose of saving us. So that's the point, all right? But what does it mean to save us? I think we heard a little bit before about, you know, being a little bit more free from the hells. Yeah, so it's essentially spiritual salvation is us finding more peace, more light, uh, 
reorienting away from selfishness, from pride and, and destruction and towards heaven's light. And that's a process for all of us. And not only that, but once we're oriented more towards God, perhaps even, you know, passed on into heaven, we still have infinite to grow because we are finite beings and God is infinite. So it takes us infinity, uh, you know, infinity plus, right, to grow into that. And we each have our own way of expressing that. So he says there is support from this, from the word in the preceding parts of this book. It will be said elsewhere that otherwise we could not have been saved. There are many passages in the word that show that he took on a human nature, places where it says that he came forth from God, came down from heaven, and was sent into the world. See the following, for example, and he quotes a number of these. Uh, we'll quote a couple from the top. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. John 16. I proceeded forth and came from God. I have not come of myself. He sent me. John 8. The Father loves you because you have believed that I came forth from God. John 16. And then continuously from John. And he says, you may see in 20 uh, back above that being sent into the world by the Father means taking on a human nature. And then number three. The Lord made the human nature divine from the divine nature within himself. He says there is support for this in many passages in the word. Here we select passages that support the following points. A. This happened step by step. Quoting from Luke, Jesus grew and became strong in spirit and in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So pointing out that he grows. It's not, he wasn't you know, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger from, from the womb, right? <laughs> he, he grew. And then from uh, Luke as well, Jesus increased in wisdom and age and in favor with God and humankind. And then B, uh, to this point, the divine nature worked through the human nature the way a soul works through its body. So even though it's not quite a soul, so to speak, the divine nature is kind of infinitely more than that in a way, um, it's analogous. They're essentially parallel things. In fact, often when we read scripture in a Swedenborgian lens, uh, we, we read it that way. So there's a process going on for us in scripture, something that it's inviting us to, you know, whether it's growth, whether it's realizing that we can go um, kind of off in certain ways, you know, to the negative side. In, in symbolic stories, that's how scripture often points to these things in parable. Um, but it also talks about how God did this as Christ. And so there's a kind of a parallel reading in scripture even. And so to support this point about the divine nature working through the human nature, like a soul through the body, he quotes um, many scriptures here, starting with John 5, the son cannot do anything on his own unless he sees the father doing it. So kind of like the, the body can only really do things from the soul. I do nothing of myself as my father taught me. I say these things. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Uh, that's John 8 and 9 as well. I have not spoken on my own authority. The father who sent me has given me a commandment regarding what I should say and what I should speak. That's John the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. The Father who dwells in me does these works. So he was doing essentially everything that the Father um, wanted him to do. He did what the Father did in him. And he continues to um, highlight this. And then see the divine nature and the human nature worked in complete accord. And uh, to swart that, he quotes from scripture, whatever the father does, the son also does in the same way. Just as the father raises the dead and brings them to life, so also the son brings to life those whom he wishes to. So it's also kind of pointing out some of the kind of parallels of the allegory or parables in scripture by saying Jesus Christ rose people from the dead as, as he wished to, um, mainly, maybe partly, to just point out that God is always doing that with each of us. God raises us from our deaths into heaven or into the spiritual realm and perhaps into reincarnation if you're um, into that, right? 
uh, maybe eventually, maybe right away. And so he's pointing out that a lot of things in scripture were just pointing to the reality of what God is always doing. It's like, well, why doesn't Jesus just raise us from the dead now? Why isn't he around doing these things? It's because part of the point of it was just to point to the reality of God. You know, we, we put so much stock into these earthly things, whether it's our earthly life or reputation or what have you. And yet, um, scripture is often pointing us to a higher reality, to understand something deeper and not worry or be as fearful about these things as we often are. And he goes on to quote from John, just as the father has life in himself, so he has also granted the son to have life in himself. And sometimes that's said from himself. And so that's pointing to the parallel nature of the son and the father. And then also from John 17, now they know that all things you have given me are from you. And then D, the divine nature was united to the human nature and the human nature to the divine. And he quotes, if you have known me, you have also known my father and have seen him. When Philip wanted to see the father, Jesus said, have I been with you for so long? And yet you have not known me, Philip. Those who have seen me have seen the father, have seen the father. Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father is in me? Believe me that I am in the father and the father is in me. That's John 14, seven through 11. He also quotes, if I am not doing the works of my father, do not believe me. If I am doing them, believe the works so that you may know and believe that the father is in me and I am in the father. Further, so that they all may be one as you father are in me and I am in you. So he also says, so that you all may be one and uh, we one with you actually. Um, so there is that deep connection of oneness between us all. And then also from John, on that day you will know that I am in my Father. And it continues, right? And there's a lot of beautiful quotes. If you want to catch them, I recommend you download the book um, at swedenborgercommunity.org. And he says, uh, for the next section, E, we should turn to the divine human one, as we can see from the following passages. So he's kind of talking about prayer, kind of talking about our mindset. We should turn toward this human nature of God, God in Omega, essentially, in the Alpha as well, because, right, Jesus said these things are one, but that we should turn to the divine human one, um, partly because it helps us find salvation a little bit more easily than I think some of the other practices we sometimes turn to, which is like, you know, infinite meditation, I'm going to let go of all attachment. Swedenborg says, you know, if we turn to God as the human one, kind of enables a lot of quick process, right? It, it's kind of like being superpowered. Um, and other traditions do this in their own way. There's other traditions that point to God as the divine human one. That's Hinduism. And, you know, most Hindu believers, at least the scholars and the, the, the leaders, believe all these, you know, depictions of God are one God or a whole God. And they would actually say all things are that, which is kind of how Swedenborg talks. So he's pointing to the importance of honoring the son as well as the father. And he says, if you had known me, you would also have known my father. And he says, those who see me see the one who sent me. And he says, if you have known me, you have also known my father. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. He says, those who accept me accept the one who sent me. Swedenborg says, this is because no one can see the divinity itself that is called the Father. Only the divine human one can be seen. Then the Lord, the Lord in fact said, no one has ever seen God. The only begotten Son who is close to the Father's heart has made him visible. He says, no one has seen the Father except the one who is the, with the Father. He has seen the Father. He says, you have never heard the Father's voice or seen what he looks like. And then F, Swedenborg highlights, since the Lord made his human nature divine from the divine nature within himself, and since we should turn to him and he is a son of God, we are therefore to believe in the Lord who is both father and son, as we can see from the following passages. 
So he highlights a lot of passages about believing in the name of Christ, believing in him, believing in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Um, you have to believe in the name of God or the Son to have eternal life. It's similar to what it says about believing in the name of God. So it's also saying that is about believing in the Son of God. So both, they're kind of parallel passages throughout the Bible. Believing in God, believing the name of the Son, believing the name of God. Essentially each the same thing. And in fact, anytime we think about God, even if it's, you know, from an Old Testament sense, we have to define God, if we define God at all, in things that relate to our human nature. Because our entire perspective, of course, right, is in the shape of our humanity, so to speak. So when we talk about God being wise or compassionate, even those religions that often say God is nothing like a human, what are you talking about? They often say God is compassionate, wise, etc. Right? Like Islam, like Judaism, if they say it that way, right? In terms of God not being human, they often still talk about God as merciful, etc. So God is always defined in these human ways. Yes, things that we want to live up to, but we have an understanding from a human capacity. And they're human words, compassionate, wise, loving, not totally devoid away from what it means to be of human nature, right? And so God's like, yeah, that, or Swedenborg is like, yeah, that's about God. That's what God is. In fact, God says that all the time in uh, Christ, through Christ, but also in the Old Testament, if you're looking at, uh, you know, Hebrew Christian scriptures, he highlights all these things about himself being merciful and, and loving. And so believing in the name of God is often pointing to those things because often even the names of God point to those things, right? Like Jesus is God with us. Christ is the saving one, um, etc. And, and a lot of the names we have for God, whatever our tradition tend to point to certain aspects of God, whether it's them being close, them being compassionate, them being loving. And so the name of God, according to Swedenborg and other places, has more to do with the nature of God, not getting a pronunciation right. Right? That would be kind of crazy, if, especially if your book has 300 pronunciations. It says name of God, not 300. Get all the 300 names right or one of them right. It's about quality. And in fact, the use of the word uh, name in scripture is often about quality. It's he named them, not he actually gave them names. It's that he figured out what they were like or, or uplifted their quality. Or even when it says he named them after himself, they didn't have his name. It was about they were similar to him. So moving past all these scriptures, there's a, there's a good amount here. So uh, if you want to read up on it, you can. And it's just pointing to um, all these ways that it says believe in this uh, human nature of God, which is beautiful in a lot of uh, wonderful ways, like believe in the light, believe in kind of the, the version you can see, right, etc. He says, in these passages and all others, when it mentions the Father, it means the divine nature that was in the Lord from his conception, which according to the teaching embraced by the Christian world, regarding faith was like the soul within the body and human beings. The human nature that came from this divine nature is the Son of God. Now, since this was also made divine in order to prevent people from turning to the Father alone and thereby separating the Father from the Lord in which, in whom the Father dwells, in their thought, faith, and worship, the Lord went on to teach that the Father and He are one, and that the Father is in Him and He is in the Father and that we are to abide in him, also that no one comes to the Father except through him. He also tells us that we are to believe in him, and that we are saved by a faith focused directly on him. So he's essentially saying for Christians, so that they didn't just worship the Father and separate out the human nature, Christ said each of these things. He was very specific about, no, I am, we're the same, you, you need to go through me, etc. For many Christians, it is impossible to grasp the concept that in the Lord, a human nature was made divine, Swedenborg says, primarily because they think of human, quote unquote, only in terms of the physical body and not in terms of anything spiritual. 
Yet all angels, who are spiritual beings, also have a completely human form. And everything divine that emanates from Jehovah God, everything from its first or innermost level, in heaven to its last or outmost level on earth, tends to take on a human form. So he's saying all these things essentially take on a human form because that's what God is. It's like we all have similarities, in, even between kind of the similarities of species, they all kind of point to this humanity of God. So he's, he's redefining the word human in a lot of ways, but he says this is the way, at least scripturally or, or spiritually, it should be understood. He says on angels as human forms and on everything divine tending toward the human form, see my book, Heaven and Hell, <laughs> which you can also download for free. Um, and you can also find another uh, book series on that. In that series, we don't read essentially everything in the book because although this looks like a thick book, this is, you know, four books at least. And so uh, we highlight kind of the major things we summarize in those series, Heaven and Hell. And that's one of his most uh, well-liked, uh, most downloaded, most owned books um, from his, his spiritual literature, which I recommend highly. And he says, there will also be more on this subject in forthcoming works that will draw on angelic wisdom about the Lord. For the Lord made his human nature divine by the trials to which made himself vulnerable and by them constantly being victorious. This was discussed above. I need add only the following. <laughs> Trials are battles against what is evil and false. And since what is evil and false comes from hell, they are also battles against hell. For us too, when we are subjected to spiritual trials, it is evil spirits from hell who are inflicting them. We are not aware that evil spirits are behind the trials, but an abundance of experience has taught me that they are. He's like, uh, trust me. <laughs> this is why we are rescued from hell and raised into heaven when the Lord enables us to be victorious in our trials. This is how we become spiritual individuals, by means of our trials or battles against our evils. How we therefore become angels. In a way, he's kind of saying, you know, you might have had it tough in the past. You might have some things you need to work against or to overcome um, in yourself. Uh, you might have had some hard moments. That's what eventually helps you to become an angel, overcoming them, not, you know, falling back into them constantly. But that, you know, even Christ went through his temptations and trials, and that's how we become angels. He says, the Lord, though, fought against all the hells with his own power and completely tamed, tamed, huh? and subdued them. And by doing so, since at the same time he glorified his human nature, he keeps them tamed and subdued to eternity. Hey, we like to think of hell as this like horrific place. And he often says that the, the torture that people think of isn't exactly right for hell. It's more like the torture of being hellish or hanging out with other hellish people. And to the extent you are like that, then someone else can kind of do it to you because it opens you up to spiritual vulnerability, so to speak. But he's saying, no, not, you know, not only is that other idea of hell false, but even the torturous things that we can sometimes read into Swedenborg, those things have been tamed, or at least the hell has been subdued to um, um, completely, according to this. Whatever that means, I guess. We, we might continue to reflect on what that might mean. And, and he says, before the Lord's coming, the hells had risen so far that they were beginning to trouble even angels of heaven. And with them, everyone who was entering the world and leaving the world. So he's saying like the hells were like so far out of control that they were just like screwing everything up on earth and even heaven, messing with the angels. Uh, and so he says the reason for this rise of the hells was that the church was in utter ruins. Uh, so the, the state of God with people was kind of... Uh, had fallen apart and the people of our world were wholly devoted to evil and falsity because of their idolatrous practices. So that's the entire world, not just this or that group, but everyone on our planet. And it's people from earth who make up hell. Now he also says aliens make up hell and aliens make up heaven, but he's not going into alien stuff right now. 
uh, which I think is <laughs> just fine. And that is why no one could have been saved if the Lord had not come into the world. He goes further and says, there is a great deal in the Psalms of David and the prophets, the, the books of the prophets, about these battles of the Lord, but little in the Christian gospels. These battles are what we refer to as the trials that the Lord underwent. The last being his suffering on the cross. So he's saying like a lot of the symbolism of the stories of the prophets and the Psalms of David, well, the Psalms of David are more like, God, I'm, I'm really going through some stuff, um, point to the trials of God, of the Lord, of Christ. The last of which being the suffering on the cross. And he says, this is why the Lord is called the Savior and Redeemer. Not only because he did it um, for everyone in this way, but also God does it within our, us. Like as we overcome, that power, that strength is from this one God that transcends any one religion. He says the church is sufficiently aware of this to say that the Lord conquered death or the devil, that is hell, and that he rose from death victorious, as well as that there is no salvation apart from the Lord. We shall see shortly that he also glorified his human nature and in this way became the savior, redeemer, reformer, and regenerator to eternity. Each of those things are things we should emulate in our society. Redeeming people, uplifting them, reforming them, regenerating them. Often we just send people to prison. We just want to hurt people who hurt. And it's this vicious cycle. You know, we've even done that with addicts and people with a little bit of drugs over time. And, you know, it goes on to, to ridiculous heights, how horrendous we treated people that we think don't fit in. You know, we sent people who are gay or lesbian to like insane asylums. It's so sad. Um, we should be more about not reforming gay or lesbians, because I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but uplifting each other, empowering each other, reforming our hurtful ways, our... You know, what we call people, you know, convicts or criminals when we should talk, we should more talk about their and all of our need for some rehabilitation, some regeneration, right? He says, we can see from the ample supply of passages cited above that the Lord became our savior by means of battles or trials. And there is also this from Isaiah, quote, the day of vengeance is in my heart. And the year of my redeemed has arrived. I have trodden them in my wrath. I have driven their victory down into the earth. Therefore, he became their savior. So it's pointing to Jehovah calling himself the savior. And I love that God's vengeance is essentially dismissing the evil like, and uplifting the good. Like It's in English from a translation or two removed. But we often kind of paint God in the Old Testament as just horrific, but um, because he talks like this sometimes, like, I'm going to come and I'm going to set things right. And yet we see what that meant in Christ. And we also hear Jehovah in the Hebrew scriptures talk about the importance of love and compassion above all else. Um, and I think often our scriptures, the way God has to talk to us is from whatever lens we're in at the time, even as a culture. Like we're, we're drawn to certain things. God has to kind of paint parables and stories that speak to us. And so, yes, sometimes the trials are painted in the battles that we've overcome. We, we tell a story about the battles and how God worked with the battle. And he uses that to tell a story about something deeper in ourselves and in Christ. He also says, this chapter is about the Lord's battles. There is also this in David. Lift your heads, gates. Be raised up, doors of the world so that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? Jehovah, strong and heroic. Jehovah, a hero in war. So again, relating this overcoming of spiritual battles to war. I mean, it is, right? But it often uses the kind of what we know, which is literal war. But we know how Christ felt about that. This too is about the Lord. Number five, the complete union of the divine nature and the human nature in him was affected by the suffering on the cross, which was his last trial. Support for this proposition was provided above. 
in the chapter explaining that the Lord came into the world to subdue the hells and to glorify his human nature, and that the suffering on the cross was the last battle by which he gained complete victory over the hells and completely glorified his human nature. Since then, by suffering on the cross, the Lord completely glorified his human nature that has united it to the divine nature and thereby made his human nature divine as well. It follows that he is Jehovah and God in respect to both natures. That is why in so many passages in the word Jehovah, God, or the Holy One of Israel is called the Redeemer, the Savior, or the Maker, as in the following. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. The angel said to the shepherds, Behold, I am bringing you good news, a great joy, which will be for all people. There is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and it continues. It also highlights that in the Hebrew scripture, it also calls God uh, the Savior or Redeemer of Israel. I, Jehovah God, am helping you. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. And it continues with the Hebrew scriptures calling Jehovah the Redeemer, the Maker, the Savior, etc. In fact, there's one place where Jehovah says, I am the only Savior. So when we separate the two, we're getting a little bit confused, at least from a scriptural standpoint. Uh, there's plenty of those quotes, so you can, you can read them in, uh, what section are we on? Uh, 34, I believe. He says, we can see from these passages that the Lord's divine nature called the Father, and here called Jehovah and God, and his divine human nature called the Son, and here the Redeemer and the Savior, as well as the Maker, meaning the Reformer and Regenerator, are one, not two. For it not only says Jehovah is God, and the Holy One of Israel is the Redeemer and Savior, it also says Jehovah is the Redeemer and Savior. Not only that, it even calls Jehovah the Savior and says, there is no Savior other than me. This clearly shows that the divine nature and the human nature in the Lord are one person, and that the human nature is divine as well. Since the Redeemer and Savior of the world is no other than the Lord in his divine human nature, which is called the Son. Redemption and salvation are properly credited to his human nature and are called merit and righteousness. Since his human nature bore the trials and the suffering on the cross, which means that he accomplished redemption and salvation by means of his human nature. Since then, after the union of his human nature with his inner divine nature, which was like that of a soul and body in us, they were no longer two, but were one person, according to the teaching of the Christian world. So he's, he's trying to reform some of the general Christian thinking. He's like, this is actually, this is what you believe. You, you put it in the books. So why, why so many people teaching these other things? It's, it's confusing you um, in a lot of ways, and it's, it's unhelpful. He says, the Lord was Jehovah and God in both respects. This is why some passages speak of Jehovah and the Holy One of Israel, the Redeemer and Savior. And others say Jehovah, the Redeemer and Savior, as you can see from the citations above. So I don't know about you, but he's clarifying things uh, for me. And I, I like this grounding in, uh, in the scriptures because so many people turn to those as kind of the source. Now I'll remind us, some of us say, Oh, I only, I only read my Bible. I don't believe in a denomination or this or that. But we have our own ideas. We summarize this book. We don't, even if we remember every word in it, we come up with ideas that we pull out of it and we have interpretations that we see in it. Like everything's still from our lens. We're not infinitely perceptive. So we're often, we're still in our own theology. We're in the theology of our local pastor to some degree or whatever it is. And so, these books are helpful no matter how much you know your scripture. And I think they can be helpful for people in other traditions or just have a better understanding about the roots of, of the Christian um, gospel and the Hebrew text as well. He says, The word also speaks of Christ the Savior, see Luke and John, on God and the God of Israel. So he, he keeps going through and just says, 
we, we see a lot of, of these things highlighted throughout scripture. So number six, step by step, he took off the human nature he had taken on from his mother and put on a human nature from what was divine within him, which is a divine human nature and the son of God. Now I'll point out here, because it seems peripherally re relevant, <laughs> that God is gender inclusive in the fullest sense. It's in fact, you could say species inclusive. You could say all created things inclusive because everything that's useful and functional and prolific and warm and full of comfort and life and healing, etc., is God in a kind of smaller way. It points to God. God is within it, uplifting it, empowering it. Um, and so that's why it says both male and female were made in God's image. Uh, you know, not just male and then whatever about the female. No, this was made in God's image and, and all of creation was good. Yes, humanity having the special kind of brain and mind and connection was very good at the end. But that human nature was meant to serve the rest and uplift it, right? And not dominate and control because it's somehow special. So here we are on number six. Step by step, he took off the human nature he had taken off from his mother. I'll repeat it one more time. Put on a human nature from what was divine within him, which is divine human nature in the Son of God. <clears throat> it's surely known that the Lord was divine and human. Divine because of Jehovah the Father and human because of the Virgin Mary. This is why he was God and a human being and therefore had a divine essence and a human outward nature. The divine essence from his father and the human nature from his mother. This meant that he was equal to the father with, with respect to his divinity, but less than the father with respect to his humanity. It also meant that as we are taught by the so-called Athanasian statement of faith, this human nature from his mother was not changed into or mixed with the divine essence since the human nature cannot be changed into or mixed with the divine essence. All the same, this very statement of faith, he's, he's continued to refer to this general Christian statement of faith from the Athanasian Creed. We have accepted, says that the divine nature took on a human nature, that is united itself with it as a soul with its body, so much so that they were not two but one person. It follows from this that he took off the human nature received from his mother, which was essentially like that of anyone else, and therefore material, and put on a human nature from his father, which is essentially like his divine nature and therefore substantial, thus making his human nature divine. I don't know if he'd let me like rephrase this, but to me, this also kind of means like he took whatever was human from his mother and he kind of pulled it. He grew into his divinity. You know, whether there's like a, a quick switch or, or what going on, as he said earlier, he grew, right, step by step. So he has made that clear. <clears throat> Excuse me. So putting off seems to relate to this growth process more than switcheroo. And he says, this is why the Lord is even called Jehovah and God in the prophetic books of the word. And the word of the gospels is called Lord, God, Messiah, or Christ and the Son of God the one in whom we are to believe and by whom we are to be saved. Now, since from the beginning, the Lord had a human nature from his mother and took this off step by step, while he was in this world, he therefore experienced two states, one called the state of being brought low or being emptied out, and one called the state of being glorified or united with the divine called the Father. So he had his low moments, right? We already know that. But he was brought low often because of his human or finite human nature, but then he was brought up, often at the same time in a sense, more into his divinity. The state of being brought low occurred when, and to the extent, that he was primarily conscious of the human nature received from his mother. And the state of being glorified occurred when, and to the extent, that he was primarily conscious of the human nature received from his father. In his state of being brought low, he prayed to the Father as someone other than himself. While in his state of being glorified, he talked with the Father as if talking 
with himself. In this latter state, he said that the Father was in him, and he in the Father, and that the Father and he were one. While in his state of being brought low, he bore trials. He suffered on the cross and prayed that the Father would not forsake him. Which, by the way, was still quoting scriptures. Psalm 23, I believe. 21 or 23. Read both. They're both great. <laughs> so that's interesting because I think that might have um, connected with some of your questions about this, this history here. Because if you know your scripture, you know there were times where he was like this, times where he was like this. And he's, he's clarifying why we saw that. This is because his divine nature could not be subject to any trial, let alone suffer on the cross. Yet it was divine nature that helped him overcome. So his divine nature doesn't really suffer, but it is there with us, even when we feel like we're forsaken and uplifts us. Because even his human nature was divine, right? These passages then show us that by means of his trials and the subsequent constant victories and by means of his suffering on the cross, which was the final trial, he completely subdued the hells and completely glorified his human nature, as had has been explained above. So it's that finite human part of us that fills the suffering because we still have room to grow in God often. So God still empowers us. I mean, that's pretty clear in Scripture and Swedenborg. Um, and even though it said, you know, he said, I'm forsaken, Swedenborg often points out that God is the closest with us when we feel forsaken, when we're in the middle of trials. So it's not that God actually disappears because then things would just what, disappear, right? They, they wouldn't exist. It's that we often feel that way and that God isn't suffering. In the, that divine nature isn't suffering because God just doesn't suffer. God is more than anything that could make him suffer. He gives rise to the process that includes suffering so that us finite beings can grow into our heavenly life with God. It's a process, unfortunately. It takes it to have multiple beings that seem to be, that feel like they're, you know, individuals, but also start to know, oh no, I'm actually one with God. And that process is so wonderful. And God wanted to give himself, herself so much and the love and joy that God had so much um, that God was like, I can't just be alone forever. I need I want to give this to, to people because I know it's so great. And so we continue to read on. And for his taking off the human nature received from his mother and putting on the human nature received from what was divine within him called the father, this we can see from the fact that whenever the Lord spoke directly to his mother, he did not call her mother, but woman. I don't think it was as like hurtful as it might sound today, like ma'am. Or something right uh, we find only three places in the gospels where he speaks directly to his mother or about her and in two of these he called her woman while in one he did not acknowledge her as his mother as for the two in which he called her woman we read in john jesus mother said to him they have no wine jesus said to her what have i to do with you woman my hour has not yet come and also when Jesus from the cross saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by her, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. So although the scripture sometimes calls Mary mother, Jesus, in the quotes, never did. The one occasion on which he did it not acknowledge her is in Luke. They announced to Jesus, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside and we want, and want to see you. Jesus answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. In other passages, Mary is called his mother, but never from his own mouth. It says there is further support for this in the fact that he did not acknowledge himself to be the son of David. In fact, we read it in the Gospels. Jesus asked the Pharisees, saying, What is your view of the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, David's. He said to them, So how is it that David in the Spirit calls him his Lord when he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right until I make your enemies a stool for your feet. So if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one could answer him a word. That's, a, that's one of those places where people get pretty upset in the scriptures because he's like, I'm not actually son of David, 
or the Lord's not really the son of David, I'm not the son of David, even though it's said he'll be the son of David or the offspring of David. And he's pointing out literally this is not true. Like David calls the Lord father, you know. Um, but in the in the spiritual sense, I think Swedenborg explores um, in some places, you know, the son of David is like saying the son of God because David often represented God. But he's saying, but in a literal way, Jesus clarifies, no, of course I'm not the son. How could the Lord be the son of David if David calls the Lord father? It's kind of similar to Swedenborg's point about Mary. Um, so it's, it's interesting. We can see from all this that as far as his glorified human nature was concerned, the Lord was neither the son of Mary nor the son of David. He showed Peter, James, and John what his glorified human nature was like when he was transfigured before their eyes. His face shone like the sun, and his clothing was like light. And then a voice from a cloud said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. So I think it's interesting when Christ kind of shows his, his truer external form, not just the form he was kind of born with from his mother, he just shone like the sun. You couldn't even see him, right? Like he, he was shining. Uh, and that's when God says, this is my son. And so a lot of times we get hung up on even the, you know, if God is gender inclusive or all these things inclusive. Why does he look like a guy with, you know, with a beard or whatever? Um, well, it's pointing out God looks like the sun. God shines spiritual light. Um, that may not uh, convince all of you, but I think that's a good, good indication that the limitations that we see even in God's outermost uh, in scripture are a semblance or God is an infinite, right? Even in his human nature, it transcends um, any one specific tradition or, or thing. The Lord also looked to John like the sun shining in its strength in Revelation. We are assured that the Lord's human nature was glorified by what it says about his glorification in the Gospels, such as the following from John. <laughs> the hour has come for the Son of Humanity to be glorified. He said, Father, glorify your name. A voice came from heaven saying, I both have glorified it and will glorify it again. So it's interesting that it's pointing to the name being the son of human humanity, the, the human nature of God. Not like a specific, the name Jehovah, the name Jesus, whatever, whichever name, but glorify your son. Glorify your is the same as glorify your name in this passage, it seems. And so... Um, I think that helps to define what whatever this Greek word was and, and also in the Hebrew um, for, for name, what it really meant in a, a spiritual sense. It says, I both have glorified it and will glorify it again because the Lord was glorified step by step. Again, he quotes, after Judas went out, Jesus said, now the son of humanity is glorified and God is glorified in him. God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. John 13. Again, Jesus said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that your son may also glorify you. And in Luke, was it not necessary for Christ to suffer this and enter into his glory? It's interesting. Things that highlight the necessity of suffering often for Christ. And in a way, if it's happened in our own lives, that's something that's going to be, you know, part of our journey towards God. And we'll view, look back hopefully at one day in the light of that uh, heavenly figure and see the culmination of all these events, even the tragic ones, uh, unfortunately. And yet fortunately. These things were said about his human nature, Swedenborg said. The Lord said, God is glorified in him and also God will glorify him in himself and glorify your son so that your son may also glorify you. The Lord said these things because the union was reciprocal the divine nature with the human nature and the human nature with the divine that is why he also said i am in the father and the father is in me and all that is mine is yours and all that is yours is mine so the union was full all that was yours is mine all that mine is yours vice versa so it's full it's whole it is the same with any union swedenborg says unless it is reciprocal it is not full this is what the union of the Lord with us and of us with the Lord must be like. 
As he tells us in the passage in John, on that day you will know that you are in me and I am in you, John 14. And in this passage, abide in me and I will abide in you. Those who abide in me and I in, in whom I abide bear much fruit. Because the Lord's human nature was glorified, that is made divine, Swedenborg says, on the third day after his death, he rose again with his whole body, which is not true of any human being, since we rise again with our spirit only and not with our body. It's funny, he's using human being in that more finite sense sometimes. It's hard to, hard to escape, I guess. So we should know this, and so that no one should doubt that the Lord rose again with his whole body. He not only said so through the angels who were in the tomb, but also showed himself to the disciples in his human form with his body, saying to them when they thought they were seeing a spirit, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he said, had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. That's in Luke and John. And again, Jesus said to Thomas, reach your fingers here and look at my hands. Reach your, out your hand and put it in my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Then Thomas said, my Lord and my God. To make it even clearer that he was not a spirit, but a person, he said to the disciples, have you any food here? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and ate it in their presence. Since his body was no longer material, Swedenborg says, but had become divine substance, he came to the disciples when the doors were closed and disappeared after they had seen him. Once the Lord was in this state, he was carried up and set down at the right hand of God. For it says in Luke, it happened that while Jesus blessed his disciples, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And in Mark, after he had spoken to them, he was carried up into heaven and set down at the right hand of God. Swedenborg clarifies that sitting down at the right hand of God means gaining divine omnipotence. So the right hand of God is often used in scripture to reflect or mean divine omnipotence. Uh, and so he's saying scripture is continuing to use this symbol. Um, just as it says in the Hebrew scriptures, I will use my own right hand to save, to uplift. And so it's pointing out Christ is essentially what this means or gained this in his glorified state. Since the Lord rose into heaven with his divine and human natures united into one and set at the right hand of God, which means gaining omnipotence, it follows that his human substance or essence is now just like his divine substance or essence. To think otherwise would be like thinking that his divine nature was raised into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, but not together with his human nature. This is contrary to scripture and also contrary to the Christian teachings that in Christ God and a human being are like the soul and the body. To separate them is also contrary to sound reason. It is this union of the Father with the Son or of the divine nature with the human nature that is meant in other passages. Uh, which he quotes. Every one of us who is saved ascends to heaven, he says, though not on our own, but rather through the Lord's power. Only the Lord ascended on his own and in his body, um, at least according to Swedenborg, was raised up on his own and ascended on his own in his body. And number seven, in this way, God became human on both the first or innermost level and the last or outermost level. He says, it is explained at some length in my other book, Heaven and Hell, that God is human and that because of God, all angels and spirits are human. And there will be more on this topic in the books about angelic wisdom to come. While from the beginning, God was human on the first or innermost level, he was not yet human on the last or outermost level. After he took on a human nature in the world, though, he also became human on the last or outermost level. This follows from what has been shown above, namely that the Lord united his human nature with his divine nature and in this way made his human nature divine as well. That is why the Lord is called the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. 
This is in the book of Revelation, quoting, I am the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. When John saw the Son of Humanity in the midst of seven lampstands, quoting, John fell at his feet as dead, but the Son of Humanity laid his right hand on him, saying, I am the first and the last. Also, behold, I am coming quickly to give to all according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Not so in Isaiah. Thus says Jehovah the King of Israel, the Israel and Israel's Redeemer, Jehovah Sabaoth, I am the first and the last. Well, that is the last for us today, folks. Um, thank you for joining me in this book discussion. I know we have a book crew or two around the world, and one in Australia, and um, some small groups here that might still be following along. So thank you for joining us. And um, we will continue to dive through this book, hopefully chapter by chapter, for the most part, uh, until we're done. Again, it's not that long. So, you know, it's like a small section of this one. And so feel free to download it, read it on your own, come to your own conclusions and continue to connect with us at Swedenborgian Community Online and go forth knowing that you are loved. Bye.